from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out on a beautiful, uh, summery uh, June day here at, in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress. And I'm thrilled to welcome you all to our inaugural LGBT poetry celebration uh, this afternoon featuring poets Joan Larkin, Camila Aisha Moon, D.A. Powell, and Dan Vera. Uh, this event could not be possible without the contribution of many organizations and individuals, both within and outside the library. First, I would like to thank Brock Thompson, a former staffer of the Poetry and Literature Center and chair of LC Globe, the professional organization for uh, LGBT staffers here at the library, uh, for coming up with the idea of this event. I would also like to thank our co-sponsor at the Library of Congress, the Rare Book and Special Collections Division, and Chief Mark Demunation, uh, who is back in the other room, uh, safeguarding the materials, which you will get a chance to see later on. Uh, Rare Book uh, Division Curator Mark Manavong has also been responsible for developing this program and for uh, curating the materials, and I I'd like to thank him as well, but I'll tell you a little bit more about him later. Finally, we are delighted to be working uh, with an outside organization, Capital Pride, uh, and to be a part of Pride Week uh, here in the nation's capital. I would like to welcome uh, Capital Pride Board President Bernie D'Elia and uh, thank uh, its executive director, Ryan Boss. We hope this is the first, oh, there they are. Please give them a round of applause. Uh, we hope this is the first of many such celebrations highlighting the work of LGBT poets and writers and their essential contributions to our culture. So before we begin, let me ask you to take out your cell phones and any electronic devices that you have that might be on and turn them off so we can make sure they don't interfere with today's event. I'll also tell you about uh, the Poetry and Literature Center. We are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, and uh, we put on literary readings, events, and festivals uh, like this uh, all throughout the year. If you want to find out more about uh, the literary events here at the Library of Congress, you can sign our sign-up sheet, which is right outside. There's also some information about the center. I also encourage you uh, to find out more about the uh, Rare Books and Special Collections Division. Uh, they have a reading room upstairs on the second floor of the Jefferson Building in which you can see some of these materials uh, firsthand. Uh, the Poetry and Literature Center's website is www.lsc slash poetry, and uh, the Rare Book and Special Collections Division website is www.lsc.gov slash rr slash rare book. Uh, now on to today's event. You can read about uh, our amazing quartet of poets in your print program, which all of you should have received. Um, each will read, the, they'll read in alphabetical order, and each will read their own poems, as well as uh, poetry from the Rare Books and Special Collection Division's LGBT and Poetry Collection. Uh, afterwards, Mark Manavong, who I mentioned earlier, will say a few words about the collection and then he will walk back uh, to LG113, which is right back there, and open up the doors uh, for you to come in and check out the display. It's an amazing display. Uh, I've never seen those tables so full of materials, so I'm very excited uh, to check out what's there, and, and I hope you'll join us. Um, we also have books for sale by our poets right there in the back. Uh, I told them that it would be good for them to sit at, at, their, at, their, uh, at the tables and do a book signing, because I'm sure many of you will want to get your books signed by them, but that they too will have time to see the display. Um, we'll make sure of that. But um, I encourage you to buy their books. Uh, even if they're in the other room checking out the materials, uh, let them know that you'd like to uh, get a book signed. Uh, so and now to say a few words about Capital Pride and, and uh, this celebration. Please join me in welcoming Ryan, uh, Ryan Boss.
Thank you, Rob. I uh, want to definitely give thanks to the Library of Congress for hosting this event and reaching out to us to actually include this in what we call the Pride in the Nation's Capital celebration this week. This is one of our first. This year has been, uh, we're excited to have several firsts. Uh, our first one was having our first official event in Virginia. We have, this is another first, having another official event as um, in a federal um, building agency working with the Library of Congress, part of our Pride celebration. Another first was having um, a letter from President Barack Obama actually in this year's Pride Guide. And um, another big first for us is we will have the first ever uh, military, um, official military color guard actually present um, the colors and retire the colors at this year's Pride Parade this Saturday. So we are very excited that this community here in the nation's capital is so excited and willing to participate on what Pride represents. And you, by being here today, um, are doing the same. So thank you so much. With that, I um, want to welcome um, Joan Larkin to the stage, um, who will begin tonight's, today's um, presentation. Thank you, it's really an honor to be here and to be reading with poets whose work I admire so much. Um, I'm going to read um, from two poets whose work is in the collection, and so I'll start with an Adrienne Rich poem, and after I read some poems of my own, I'll close with a, a Mae Swenson love poem. Um, this book is in the collection, but this is my own copy, and... Uh, <laughs> which I've had since the early 70s. It was published in 1973, Diving into the Wreck, which was a revelation at the time. Um, I'm a hopelessly, inveterately a teacher, so I'm gonna say a couple of things about this poem before I read it to you. Uh, we're used to thinking of Rich as a poet of long lines, but this is a uh, a poem in short lines with a lyric shape to it, and it's called Song to remind us of the tradition of lyric poetry. And, uh, and in that mode, she is speaking as a woman poet who knows who she is and is a poet of prophecy. And I'll say a couple of things about it after I read it. Song, you're wondering if I'm lonely. Okay then, yes. I'm lonely as a plane rides lonely and level on its radio beam, aiming across the Rockies for the blue-strung aisles of an airfield on the ocean. You want to ask, am I lonely? Well, of course, lonely as a woman driving across country day after day, leaving behind, mile after mile, little towns she might have stopped and lived and died in, lonely. If I'm lonely, it must be the loneliness of waking first, of breathing dawn's first cold breath on the city, of being the one awake in a house wrapped in sleep. If I'm lonely, it's with the rowboat ice fast on the shore in the last red light of the year that knows what it is, that knows it's neither ice nor mud, nor winter light, but wood with a gift for burning. And um, if poetry is memorable language, I, I find that last metaphor really unforgettable, the passion of the poet who knows who she is and knows uh, what burning her language can do. And I love, too, that her metaphoric landscape, the house where she is the first awake, and Lincoln too used the house as a, a metaphor for America. So uh, here was a poet who in 1971, when she wrote that poem, was fully aware of her destiny and of the power of her gift. She takes, uh, you know, it, the, uh, the O vowel, the loneliness, you know, that could almost be like a country western song, and turns it around and changes the value of that word, the loneliness of the poet. So um, I'm going to read from Blue Hanuman, which is my new book just out. A lot of the poems in this book are 
about artists and art. And the first poem in the book is Eye of Newt. My older brother gave me art, poetry, when I was eight or nine, handed me Kafka and Shakespeare, and I didn't know what it was, but the language got to me. So the word life in this poem is not life itself, but Life magazine, where he tore out a, a Picasso reproduction and hung it on the wall, and that's where I first encountered art. I of Newt. I was larval. I dreamed myself downstairs in PJs, still in my coma. Bach, he said, and I lay next to the radio. Dark amber spread through my girl brain. I of Newt already nestled there, an egg glued to a twig. My pale, bespectacled brother set me on a leaf and watched me fatten. Franz Kafka, he said, and my new long feelers brushed the wall. Girl before a mirror was tacked there, torn from life. Her twin pear belly, worm pink as my own, half curled, half crawling. I burst through skin after skin. Art, I said, and my wings fanned slowly open. Um, one of my friends who died in the, at the height of the uh, AIDS deaths in the 90s, Dennis O'Sullivan, a painter, inspired this poem. He was still painting uh, in his last week, weeks of life. The title, In Your Side-Railed Bed Faces, moves into the, po into the first line of the poem. In your side-railed bed, faces brushed late nights on paper, mouth knots, dark inkwash eyes staring into the abyss, world taped to the wall of your next-to-last room. After they moved you, no more making, your face swollen and no sign you saw me wearing the fright mask, grief or my face under it. This is a short uh, poem about Artemisia Gentileschi's, uh, one, of her, one of her three, I think, paintings that she did. She was an Italian Baroque painter. Uh, paintings of uh, the slaying of Holofernes by Judith. And when I looked at it, I the uh, sight of two mattresses with blood between them uh, suggested uh, a female body. Artemisia. In her third painting of Judith, a velvet knot of arms, head, fists. He's draped in carmine folds. Her gown is gold. She's forced his sword into his dense neck. Under him, the deep crease between mattresses, a blood-soaked vagina. Well, maybe I was seeing things, uh, but <laughs> Artemisia, has, her uh, greatness as a painter has often been obscured by the kind of lurid story of the, uh, the rape trial uh, of uh, a young painter who worked in her father's studio and uh, she won the, the, uh, the suit, but they put thumb screws and other, you know, tortured her in other ways to make sure that the evidence she was giving was the truth. So it goes. Um, and uh, I'm just going to read a few more. Uh, as time goes on, uh, some of the Yiddish that I heard spoken between my mother and my grandmother in my childhood has been creeping into my poems. And uh, Yiddish is a language that's rich in insults. And if you're a child hearing them and knowing they're aimed at you, you sort of pay attention. Uh, so where is it? Okay. 
And the first, so the first line of the poem is in Yiddish, but the second line translates it, so you'll hear the meaning. The Covenant. A shtick flesh mit zwei eigen. I was a piece of meat with two eyes, an animal watching another animal. She fed, dressed, named me, flushed my waist, scrubbed my pink skin till it sang. The kitchen was hers, where the iceman's tongs pincered solid blocks, cream rose in bottles inching up past the lip, coal roared through a chute into the cellar. Unsaid, invisible, the weight she carried, cold and dense as the block the iceman shouldered, stung through his burlap rag. I lapped her scorn answered her bitter call. She needed to eat. I was her meal. I was the nearest protein. And this is also a poem, uh, not just about, but to my mother, uh, in a very different tone. And the word you, mother, in it is not Y-O-U, but E-W-E, the animal, summons. Are you asleep? Are you mute? Are you empty now? Are you alone? You, mother, Shrike, mother, where did you go? Frost on a stone. Soft arms and harsh mouth. You could say I've kept them, but fold a sheet my own way. I'd like to show you. I'm six, feverish. You're reading to me white alps, your shimmering alto. Were you awake when your last string snapped? I'm yeast and air in a crust quickly swallowed. Waking in twisted sheets, I know how the green-smocked aid hoists you. When time is done with me, may there be mercy. You, mother, Shrike mother, where do you go? Frost on a stone. Are you asleep? Are you mute? Are you empty now? Are you alone? This is an untitled poem, um, eight lines. She broke the first glass and kept launching. Some flew 10 feet. Each explosion wanted the next and when she'd nothing left to throw, kitchen covered in shards, floor shining, hands stinging, shard sticking out of one cheek, she stood in what she'd made and was satisfied. So I'm going to read uh, an erotic uh, poem by May Swenson and, uh, and then close with a a short lyric uh, of mine. And, you know, Swenson uh, sort of hid her sexual identity in plain sight. She was of a generation that uh, didn't want to claim the label. And when um, Ellie Bulkin and I uh, edited in 1975 a, an anthology called Amazon Poetry, Swenson very excitingly gave us permission to include a poem called To Confirm a Thing and said maybe people will finally understand what this poem is about in this context. But uh, in um, 1980, when we wanted to include poems of hers in an anthology called Lesbian Poetry, she wrote a very irritated letter to us and said, why can't you call it Amazon 2, you know? And she refused permission. But the year before she died, in 1988, she gave permission to Carl Morse and me to include this love poem in uh, Gay and Lesbian Poetry in Our Time. And then she died. So, forward lines. Your eyes are just like bees and I feel like a flower. Their brown power makes a breeze go over my skin. When your lash lashes ride down and rise like brown bees legs, your pronged gaze makes my eyes gauze. 
I wish we were in some shade and no swarm of other eyes to know that I'm a flower breathing bare, laid open to your bee's warm stare. I'd let you wade in me and seize with your eager brown bee's power, a sweet glistening at my core. And um, I'll close with Cutleaf Beach, which uh, ends uh, this book. Half closed eye after eye climbs her rough smooth swells like the god of breasts I worship with my touch mouth. Silver tree skin, robin running on two legs, twisted rope of wisteria, tell me my nipple is an eye and where I walked in milk light, trees are feeding the dark, cars, cars rushing where I sleep. Eye, close, mouth open, blown bird, press your shaking branch. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be um, in this company of poets um, and all of your company um, in this place for this fine occasion. Um, I'm also going to read two um, poems from um, writers included in the archive. And I think I'll start with a brief poem by County Cullen, who was a seminal figure in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, I have a rendezvous with life. I have a rendezvous with life in days I hope will come. Ere youth has sped and strength of mind, ere voices sweet grow dumb. I have a rendezvous with life when spring's first heralds hum. Sure, some would cry it's better far to crown their days with sleep than face the road, the wind and rain, the heat, the calling deep. Though wet nor blow nor space I fear, yet fear I deeply too. Lest death should meet and claim me here, I keep life's rendezvous. And the second poet is Rigoberto Gonzalez, who just won in Gay Poetry the Lambda Literary Award last night. So, very happy for him. An amazing poet, you should check his work out. Um, this is called Full Moon on the Night My Father Died. And then silence, no mouth with the urge for teeth, a hand without its switch, stones, not feet. If a woman cries and is not heard, there was no grief, no leg collapsing at the knee, no widow spilling open like a sack of feed, the moon having paused to see, moves on. Just another night's comma, just another eyelid fluttering to the flash of lightning, the living call father or husband or son, what the dead call anti-sleep. And now I will read from my collection. This is She Has a Name. And about two thirds of this collection is about a family's journey with a daughter who has autism um, and all the dynamics um, that come with that um, condition. This first poem, when I first turned this co um, collection in to be published, the statistic was one in 150 American families dealing with autism. And I'm gonna use the most recent statistic. Borderless country. One in 68 now, this glitch in babies poised to unlock the world. These daughters and sons of poets, store clerks, salesmen, singers, CEOs, janitors and actors cast into this permanent script. Souls we love turned like the faces of flowers thrust toward a rogue sun. We are the earth we walk, what seeps here, 
Is the air fighting back? Is the water slowing baskets down, sending them back upstream? Are we changing? Dear God, are they here to tell us in a way we can't ignore that we aren't changing fast enough? Autism, the one drop rule for minds we strain to understand, the catch-all phrase that drops kids off at nowhere, at you don't exist once you turn 18, at native tongue of one, at white knuckle translation cobbled through touch across time, at marquee symptoms while causes lurk, at beauty that demands seas of patience. What about that drug I took once? Vaccines? Some karmic boomerang I don't remember throwing its stealth return. One in 68 apples of somebody's eye. One in 68, my baby. One in 68 now, a new child breathes. Private riddles of our loving, strapped on many backs. Breach. It seems the most special of beings endure harrowing beginnings. The covering physician didn't know her body's history. He treated mama with less grace than a laboring mare, almost dragging her off the table, and she had no choice as he ripped my sister into this world. father's voice. The last thing I ever wanted was to let her down. I held her high in the bowels of my biceps until her legs began to grapevine around mine. She didn't wriggle like my older girls did, restless for ground, no. Lord, no, please, not my baby girl, not the one named after mama, gone. Mouth carved just like hers, like mine. What could I have done? held her as long as any father's strength could stand her growing weight. What next? My chromosome limps in her bloodstream. The proof, years later, my brother's son scales this cliff. I'm not allowed to say I don't want to pay what she will cost us. I'll work myself into pulp, withhold my tongue, and practice nothingness. Cockroach logic, if I don't move, I'm not really against this wall, back gleaming in harsh light. I won't hold my wife's hand and skip words like stones. I'll become a dyke of a man, fall asleep in front of the TV nightly until I burst. Mother. I watched the backs of college girlfriends trailing off to mobile lives. I watched them until they were blitz. Ours was a sacred exile then, waterfalls of words between us, silhouettes in love tending our own, the hours, clouds floating past, beds in the sky where rain slept. I often wake up dizzy, the sun mocking us as it dosses her face. My husband says nothing, his kiss is shallow, what we don't say we eat. Stigma, she hated that short yellow bus. The sentence fell each day it pulled up sign to McMurray Junior High's curb, delivering her to locker-lined halls full of metallic seventh grade teeth. No room for gray. Between is a hard place to live. She shuns wheelchairs and mongoloid faces, mad that her mind will fight to keep her quarantined from her own car, yard, babies. You are or you're not. You're sick or you're well, one thing or another. But it's never that simple like breathing should be. Between is a hard place to live. Each morning, she stretches her fingers toward a life just out of reach and grudgingly squeezes into a seat at a table that bumps her knees. College is not Canaan, sis. Not a promised land to independence, to normal, not etched in stone. Come down from your Mount Nebo of longing, 
Discover your own route to paradise. We'll meet you there. Yeah, I think I'll read this one here. Waving, they stand behind the screen as they always have, sacred sentinels. When did it happen? The soul dry rot, the end of heavy breathing, the loss of their first names. Their bones and the arthritic dogwood limbs brace against each other in the yard, wavering in January wind without blooms. Each visit home frays me, the price I pay for being able to drive away. This is a New York poem. Watching a woman on the M101 Express. I'm, I live in Brooklyn now, I guess I should say that, yes. Um, you sit in a hard blue seat, one of the ones reserved for the elderly or infirm, a statue of need. Your mouth open as if waiting for water or medicine, as if mugged mid-sentence, or some ice age hit right after terrible news. Oblivious to the metro's bump and buck, to the toddler begging in Spanish to be freed from her stroller, to my ogling, you sit embalmed, raccooned or moosed. You have the kind of eyes that never quite close, even in deepest sleep, lids and undersized t-shirt that leaves belly exposed. Tears navigate moles, veteran swimmers of your creek bed face, I can't stop looking. You can't get over whatever has happened. So shell-shocked that birds could land and roost. I want to ask, just so you know someone is paying attention, but not enough to know what ravages. It's rude to stare. I'm from the South, a suburb where grief pulls the shades first, stays home if indecent. But your sorrow struts four rows down from me, strands you an astronaut on some distant, undiscovered moon. Bodies to your left and right read papers, nap, send text messages. You sit in a hard blue seat, mouth open. I study the pink of your jaw and wonder if you'll come back before your stop comes. And I think I will end with something sweet. Yes. To a camellia blossom. I saw your pretty head lying beneath the bush. Without thinking, I kneeled and cradled you, petals sighing into grateful palms. Beauty face down is an abomination. Why must you suffer the weight of early perfection? Your vividness lifts me, lifts all. I wanted to hold you just like that until I know this kind of blooming well to be so lush inside so swollen with life that what was meant to hold you up can't. I wasn't meant to hold you. Yet here we are on this stray brisk day in April, trembling and fulfilled, unlikely and true. Before I knew what to call you, I reached and imagined season after season unmoored. Thank you. It is an honor and a privilege to be here today with my peers, my sisters, and my brothers, and um, to read for you uh, from a couple of poets who inspired me in my journey as a poet. Um, I'm going to begin with a poem by Muriel Rukeyser. It's entitled, Looking at Each Other. Yes, we were looking at each other. Yes, we knew each other very well. Yes, we had made love with each other many times. Yes, we had heard music together. Yes, we had gone to the sea together. Yes, we had cooked and eaten together. Yes, we had laughed often, day and night. Yes, we fought violence and knew violence. Yes, we hated 
the inner and outer oppression. Yes, that day we were looking at each other. Yes, we saw the sunlight pouring down. Yes, the corner of the table was between us. Yes, bread and flowers were on the table. Yes, our eyes saw each other's eyes. Yes, our mouths saw each other's mouths. Yes, our breasts saw each other's breasts. Yes, our bodies entire saw each other. Yes, it was beginning in each. Yes, it threw waves across our lives. Yes, the pulses were becoming very strong. Yes, the beating became very delicate. Yes, the calling, the arousal. Yes, the arriving, the coming. Yes, there it was for both entire. Yes, we were looking at each other. Walt Whitman, to a stranger. Passing stranger, you do not know how longingly I look upon you. You must be he I was seeking or she I was seeking. It comes to me as of a dream. I have somewhere surely lived a life of joy with you. All is recalled as we flit by each other, fluid, affectionate, chaste, matured. You grew up with me, were a boy with me, or a girl with me. I ate with you and slept with you. Your body has become not yours only, nor left my body mine only. You give me the pleasure of your eyes, face, flesh, as we pass. You take of my beard, breast, hands in return. I am not to speak to you. I am to think of you when I sit alone or wake at night alone. I am to wait. I do not doubt. I am to meet you again. I am to see to it that I do not lose you. So um, I'm going to read a couple of poems from uh, my uh, collection, Useless Landscape, or A Guide for Boys, um, which came out, uh, I guess, two years ago now. Uh, it's hard to keep up. Um, one of the, uh, well, the original intent of this collection was to elegize and to celebrate the uh, the interior landscape of California, uh, which is a place in transition, a place uh, moving from farm to suburban to urban, um, and uh, watching that change uh, was the first intent of that book and chronicling it. But um, it, you know, what happens is as you're writing, other subjects take precedence. And what I realized after I wrote the book is that this book became a way of affirming and celebrating a queer life in a rural sitting setting. Um, and so um, I'm going to begin with one of the uh, early poems, and you will hear the um, uh, the lives sort of coming to uh, the, um, the forefront of the poem. And um, it's called Landscape with Sections of Aqueduct. If the crown of day is not gold, then it's a marvelous fake. Merciful present tense. If the brown grass is always flowing, if the sun is always just brushing the dry hills, and if last summer's suicide is still a loner whose white t-shirt knotted so tight it had to be cut off his neck with a penknife, thin evening is the same bare patch and the same fat crows, the crushed aluminum cans, 
and the hamburger wrappers or the ribbon of tire tread where a road crew hasn't come by. They have taken him away and I do not know where he is laid. Among the soft cheat and meadow barley, a live oak begs relief from the hardened light, the beating of its own gnarled limbs and the unrelenting rustle of its own beige blooms that tumble together shyly like a locker room of boys, once boisterous, now called to roll and suddenly bashful, clasping at dingy towels. Let the dead be modest. Give the tree, solitary being who feeds on wind and the moat of another's distant beauty, cause to brag. Except that the kernel would fall upon the soil, it abides alone. One guy peeled labels off beer bottles here. Another climbed the remaining concrete piles and wrote, Justin loves, wrote, Stephen loves, wrote, hang em high, class of 93. Cabbage moths flickered in tansy and clustered broom rape, bore the pain of creation for a little yellow dust a smear of light on their fidgeting legs and the sudden buoyancy in updraft. Ruin by the wayside you took as sacrament, you abiding rock. This poem uh, takes its title from a film by Bruce Beersford uh, entitled Tender Mercies. Um, the film uh, bears a, a sort of a tangential relationship to the poem. Um, in the film, uh, Robert Duvall plays a country singer ha who has sort of hit rock bottom and has to go back to where he started and start over. Um, we all got to do that sometimes. Tender mercies. The dandelions. Ditch blown brood. The evening snow and dew soaked flocks. The brewer's pea. The Jepson's pea. These the bright eyes of the viridian fields. In chaparral, the hillside pea and angled pea, intensities of light and pomp that distress the easy upswept grass. The smack the rain plants as it smudges past and penetrates the canvas. The smattering on field and railroad tracks, both hardy blooms and dainty flowers. The judge's house, the chicken farm, a migratory camp, a flesh motel, a stucco digs where all that mitigates the August smelter is the swamp cooler's immutable burr, a straggling house that draws its water from a hard water well and flushes out with the help of a crude sump pump. Before the flat land is occluded by the staunch of light at end of day, I wanted to be content with all its surfaces, weed, barb, crack, real rise. But every candid shoot and fulgent branch depends upon the arteries beneath. The houses have their siphons and their circuit vents. The heart, I mean the literal heart, must rely upon its own plaqued valves. The duodenal canal, its unremitting grumble, the brain upon its stem and underneath a network vast of nerves that rationalize. The earth's a little harder than it was, but I expect that it will soften soon, voluptuous in some age hence because we captured it as art the moment it was most itself, fragile, flecked with nimble weed, and so alone it almost welcomed its own ravishment. I was a maiden in this versicolor plain. I watched it change, withstood that change, the infidelities of light, 
the solar interval, the shift of time, the shift from farm to town. I had a man that pressed me down into the soil. I was that man. I was that town. They call the chicory ragged sailors here, sojourners who have finally returned and are content to see the summer to its end. Be unafraid of what the future brings. I will not use this particular blue again. And I'm going to finish with a poem uh, which was uh, written for um, a young man I knew when I was a young man, very young. Um, how many of you dated a Mormon missionary at some point? <laughs> Happens, right? Yes. And there's that, uh, you know, unfortunate conflict that arises. Um, so to celebrate his life, I wrote Missionary Man. We must bear away the body to another place. That's Oscar Wilde. And the second epigraph that begins the poem, Isaiah. Then said I, here am I, send me. The product of poor radiography, this one rectangular window through which the faintest of flowers might be seen, as each plastered vegetative eye awoke in traction and sought to be dismissed from the unreliable dispensary to which it was tied, so too did I petition to be moved into any upper room that might have me. Let the next who comes invite me so, if night can take it, shall we thread it like a spider, glance around its unlit cistern, complecting our moonstruck strands toward the vortices we've kept from thus exploring. Let him knock with a promise of books, good looks, cutaway collar, skinny black tie the pocket protector with his name engraved. For the bandages were still to be unwound. Had I ever thought about being saved? No, I had only ever thought about being spent. And unmended in my bones, I fostered such attraction to this ardent host himself the aseptic, argent lancet brought to pierce me in my side. It was his first penetrating glance that filled me with a sudden surge of blood, rack, rent, and bungle of my corpus. Let me say, I stank like the rim of hell in all my lust and would have blushed at my own heat if not for the shameless eagerness in his eyes. The world is full of lovely but tragic boys. Get me on the joy bus, I said. Nobody ever really rides the joy bus. He prepared a place for me in the empty houses, received me in the shaded summer lawns, wrapped in our own light jackets at the river bottoms, hid in manzanita clumps, the break, the brittle fern, in the foyer of a Pentecostal church where we took our gladness to spite the pious, took the praise of God as an offering of our bodies, each of us crouched in the doorway in turn, mouth to the vine, lips to the Eucharist, flesh of my astonished flesh. John, my elder, John, my boy, the body is dead to us, naughty, then gone. Suffer me to kiss thy mouth, John. I will kiss thy mouth. Let him be born of every ash that glows in the oil drums of winter parks. 
Let lesions disappear. Let brittle bones be knit. Let the integrity of every artery be restored. There is no God but that which visits us in skin and few and pleasing face. He offers up this body. By this body, we are saved. It's a great delight uh, to read today um, and to follow such uh, astounding verse. Um, uh, the, I had actually, uh, um, when I was asked uh, which poet I was going to read from, I had originally uh, mentioned uh, James Broughton, um, a poet that I corresponded with before he died. Uh, but discovering that today is actually uh, would have been the 88th birthday of Allen Ginsberg, I decided to sort of switch. And uh, so uh, I'm reading uh, uh, two poems by Ginsberg uh, to begin. The first uh, is in the collection. And then the second um, that I know of isn't published anywhere, but uh, due to uh, the Rainbow History Archives uh, here in Washington, D.C., they have an audio recording um, from the very first March on Washington uh, 35 years ago this October. Uh, October 14th, 1979, a poem at that very first March on Washington, gay March on Washington, um, uh, there were two poets present. Uh, Allen Ginsberg was one and Audre Lorde uh, was the other. And uh, those audio recordings uh, are evidence of their words. Uh, so the first poem, he read two poems. So I'm reading what he read on the other side of the Capitol. The weight of the world is love under the burden of solitude, under the burden of dissatisfaction. The weight, the weight we carry is love. Who can deny? In dreams it touches the body, in thought constructs a miracle, in imagination anguishes till born inhuman, looks out of the heart burning with purity, for the burden of life is love. But we carry the weight wearily, and so must rest in the arms of love at last, must rest in the arms of love. No rest without love, no sleep, without dreams of love, be mad or chill, obsessed with angels or machines. The final wish is love, cannot be bitter, cannot deny, cannot withhold if denied. The weight is too heavy, must give, for no return as thought is given in solitude, in all the excellence of its excess. The warm bodies shine together in the darkness. The hand moves to the center of the flesh. The skin trembles in happiness, and the soul comes joyful to the eye. Yes, yes, that's what I wanted. I always wanted, I always wanted to return to the body where I was born. Congress and American people, how can you help yourself? We have come out here to help you to ease your grief-stricken hearts. Fear of gays is claustrophobia, closed minds, violence, accusation, hypocrisy, tough hearts hiding panic. This day's gay liberation can mean liberation of heterosexual dignity, social delight, city playfulness, country tolerance, national non-aggression, international charm and spiritedness, enlightened masculine gentleness, feminine mutual affection, granny wisdom's old-fashioned open-mindedness, diversity of the physical body politic, Yay, self-acceptance of body, humor of speech, spaciousness, friendliness, sensitivity, the dignity and wisdom of the whole blue sky of the mind we stand under. So a poem um, uh, that opens um, uh, my last book uh, inspired by Jones reading, uh, the title is in uh, Yiddish. So, 
It's titled Kvetch. As my Gentile tongue screws up that perfect Yiddish sound, Kim complains we have no right to a word if it's mispronounced. I tell her, cry me the River Grande River and recite the litany of the beautiful made bland. They made La Olla merely jolly and drove the angels right out of Los Angeles. They even made La Virgen into what a loop. And then I learn it's from the Arabic, Guadalupe, from Wadi Lupus, for the valley where wolves reside. Folded up and carried over oceans and epochs, syllable reminders of our grandmother's voices that reside inside the hollow of the ear till they come cascading miraculous out of a stranger's mouth, mangled accents and twisted tenses all. Uh, this next poem uh, was inspired by something in the Library of Congress collection, which is a, a wax cylinder recording that's believed to be the only existing recording of uh, Walt Whitman. Um, and uh, uh, many believe you know, Whitman to be uh, one of the pillars of American poetry. Uh, if there's another pillar, the other pillar would be Emily Dickinson. And thinking of that wax cylinder of Whitman made me wonder about Emily Dickinson's voice. Um, and this poem is titled, Emily Dickinson at the Poetry Slam. I will tell you why she rarely ventured from her house. It happened like this. One day she took the train to Boston, made her way to the darkened room, put her name down in cursive script and waited her turn. Poets before her stood and rhymed, followed a meter tight and expected, outdoing one another in a monotonous clip. When they read her name aloud, she made her way to the stage, straightened the papers in her hands, pages and envelopes, the backs of grocery bills. She closed her eyes for a minute, took a breath, and began. From her mouth, perfect words exploded, intact formulas of light and darkness. She dared to rhyme with words like cochineal and describe the skies like diadem. Obscurely worded incantations filled the room with an alchemy that made the very molecules quake. The solitary words she handled in her upstairs room with keen precision came rumbling out to make the electric lights flicker. Forty members of the audience were treated for hypertension. Twenty-year-old dark-haired beauties found their heads had turned a Moses White. Her second poem erased the memory of every cell phone in the nightclub, and by the fourth line of the sixth verse, the grandmother in the upstairs apartment had been cured of rheumatism. The papers reported the power outages, area hospitals taxed their emergency generators, and sirens were heard to wail through the night. Quietly, she made her way to the exit, walked to the terminal, and back to Amherst. She never left her room again, and never read such syllables aloud. A praise poem for a radical fairy brother named Coco. This poem is titled Balinesia in Suburbia. Praise Coco, born Bruce, who ever, every week bought an orchid for his cell between the elevator and the boardroom, who misted them meticulous and thus transformed suburbia into Balinesia. Everyone knew Bruce for the ways he broke forth from blandness, with the spotted cowls of Phalaenopsis, cymbidium striped fingers, and the purple mouths of dendrobium, all of them pouring over the cubby holes of work life. Praise what resided in Coco to know what could love a light fluorescent and make the stale air bloom with hue. So um, my father, um, who I had a, a loving and troubled relationship with, uh, passed away a little over a month ago. And... Um, and given the uh, topic uh, of the reading, I thought I would read this poem from my first book titled Father's Day for Gay Boys. 
one beside another, brothers, seven diviners of what lies beyond the truths we have uncovered. One makes three, then four, then more until we move beyond our numbers. There is thunder over the city tonight, and of the million hearts we may never see, here in the circle we make commitments. We push the limits of earthly loving. Electricity visits again, and the black skies pulse with light, currents of power by some capillary action. Sons kiss their fathers, sons kiss their fathers to sleep, and the rose-eyed boy remembers himself again. We are not the sons they ordered with their patriotic dreaming. We are not the sons they expected to come down the line. But we unfold beyond such kind paternal ignorance. We unfold within the measure of our time, and we make peace with the fathers inside of us. We give birth to a hidden, long-carried joy within. I wanted to read a poem by um, uh, William Meredith, who um, was the first uh, gay poetry consultant. Um, I'm not sure exactly how out he was during his cult consultancy, but certainly by the end of his life, uh, he and Richard Hardy's uh, another writer, uh, wrote and uh, talked about their lives together. This poem is titled, A Couple of Trees. The two oaks lean apart for light. They aren't as strong as lone oaks, but in a wind they give each other lee. Daily since I cleared them, I can see them tempting to chainsaw and ax, two hardwoods leaning like that for light. A hurricane tore through the state one night, picking up roof and hen house, boat and dock. Those two stood, leafless, twigless, giving lee. Last summer, ugly slugs unleafed the trees. Environmental kids wrote, gypsy moths suck. The V of naked oaks leaned to the light for a few weeks, then put out slight second leaves, scar tissue, pale as bracts, bandaged comrades lending each other lee. How perilous in one another's V our lives are, yoked in this yoke, two men leaning apart for light, but in a wind who give each other lee. And um, two more poems. Um, this was written, um, I'm forgetting now, I think it was when Delaware uh, enacted marriage equality. Uh, it was written for that day, but it seems to have been repeated. Um, it's titled, On a Day When Another State Sees Us. Recognizes us for who we are, how we love, how we commit ourselves to one another. I tell you, look, lover, laugh a little to say the word husband. So strange to me, two syllables I never believed could be mine much less take the appearance of one so sweet and kind. Years from now, perhaps, if the insistence of gentleness has its way, who we are together will not be remarkable, merely the first names on the roll of some kind of permanence. The words do not mean more than our promises, but they are something. They, a reality longed for, lived and died for, I will not make light of it, although I will giggle a little, thinking this is our life together. And I'll close with uh, a poem about, um, really set in the 60s. Uh, it opens with an epithingy um, <laughs> from the New York Times, uh, actually a, a, from an uh, article in the New York Times dated December 17th, 1963. Uh, the poem is titled Lingering Fraction. Some homosexuals claim infallibility in identifying others of their kind by the eyes. There's a look that lingers a fraction of a second too long. Growth of overt homosexuality in city provokes wide concern. New York Times. 
Hail the lingering fraction that secured us, that inborn longing that led us to one another, one by one on the corners, under the street lamps of the inviting city. Hail the steel of spirit that attempted to believe, that ventured forth from body to body, when the law and word was to condemn, to revile, to electrocute a mind so wedded to love. Hail the glimmer of recognition in the eyes of those we sought, who reflected back that fraction of belonging, who spoke without words what the heart would dare to admit. Thank you. Thank you again to our poets for being here today. Uh, my name is Mark Manavong, and I'm a curator in the Rare Book and Special Collections Division here at the library uh, with specific responsibilities in LGBT studies and poetry. Um, I've always been lucky that way. Um, we, the, the Rare Book and Special Collections Division holds more than a million items uh, spread across more than 90 collections. Uh, we've arranged today a, a small display, a small fraction of those materials in the back room, which I hope you'll stop by to see. I hope it illustrates some of the treasures that we hold, as well as some of the presses that we collect, such as the Shameless Hussy Press, the Jargon Society, and uh, many others, as well as some of the individual authors that we collect, such as James Merrill, uh, Adrian Rich, um, Moon Larkin, uh, Powell and Vera, who are now going to mingle among our collections. Um, so without further ado, please step back and follow me and uh, have a look. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.